Martin Lawrence went on a near unprecedented run for a black comedian in the 90s and early 2000s. Starring as the titular character in his own legendary sitcom for five seasons, it became increasingly obvious that Martin's infectious personality was too big to be confined to network TV. Before the show ended, he had already proved he could not only handle comedic scenes, but action scenes as well by co-starring alongside Will Smith in Michael Bay's Bad Boys, a match made in heaven for the two versatile actors. The same could be said for his role in life alongside Eddie Murphy. The two illustrious comedians had such great chemistry that it never seemed like one outshined the other. But Martin would have his moment in the spotlight, and I don't just mean his hilarious run till that special. Headlining such films as Blue Streak, Big Mama's House, National Security, and of course, the inevitable Bad Boys 2. He got a chance to flex his romantic chops in a thin line between love and hate, and he even got a chance to show off how much heart his films could have with Rebound. However, there's one particular project that Martin helmed during that time that perfectly integrates all of his strengths into one feature film. It's got all the comedy, action, romance, and heart that Martin would become synonymous with. 2001's Black Knight. The story on its surface is a typical fish out of water tale with our protagonist Jamal being sucked through time from the turn of the millennium all the way back to the medieval 1300s. You have all your typical man from the future doesn't understand the past isms that you'd expect from a time travel scenario, but what makes Black Knight so special is Martin himself. The way he interacts with these relatively primitive people using his comedic charm and timing is so fascinating that their reactions to his seemingly foreign behavior is just as funny as he is, giving the audience a double dose of laughter. The way their sensibilities are just modern enough for Jamal to connect with them despite being old timey is a hilarious combination that reminds me of Shrek in a way, which ironically came out that same year and also features a segment of the character singing Sly and the Family Stones dance to the music for some reason. But where Shrek is actually animated, Martin is putting on such a physical performance that he almost seems animated, juxtaposed to his more rigid contemporaries. He often uses his knowledge of the future to create quips and make references that fly right over their heads, adding even more fuel to the comedic fire. You never heard of the Black Knight? You ever heard of Shaq? Waving. The reason the story works as well as it does is because the first act does a great job at establishing the kind of character Jamal is. He's a jokester, someone who doesn't take things as seriously as he should, but most of all, he's self-interested. He starts off as someone who's willing to advise his boss to give up her failing castle-themed amusement park business rather than fight for it, even though it provides jobs to the community. I had high hopes for you. Maybe you shouldn't have. His selfishness is reinforced after it's revealed that he planned on jumping ship to a different castle-themed amusement park called Castle World. But all of Jamal's plans are put on hold when he spots a medallion in the moat below, and it sucks him down into the water, where he then springs up in medieval times where he runs into a seemingly drunk man named Nalti, who almost immediately passes out in front of him. 911! 911! White man down! White man down! After Nalti passes out, Jamal regains his composure just long enough to revive him with some breath spray, which Nalti is extremely grateful for. Jamal is still under the impression that he's in the early 2000s, so he doesn't react with the urgency that he probably should, and treats this weird experience like a bad trip. When he stumbles onto a castle, he believes that he's inadvertently made his way to Castle World, and that all the peasants and guards he sees are just paid method actors to sell the theme of the park. He fumbles his way in by accidentally announcing himself as a messenger of a foreign nation, where he's quickly introduced to the two characters that will go on to shape Jamal throughout the film. The romantic interest and chambermaid Victoria, and the rival no-nonsense knight Percival. Percival is someone who has a way of bringing out Jamal's worst impulses, not too dissimilar to what Jamal tries to do to his boss earlier in the film. Victoria encourages the best in Jamal, the same thing that Jamal's boss tries to do for him. That moment in retrospect was a microcosm for the overall themes of the film. 
but it'll be a while before Jamal learns what that theme is because he's soon swept up into the kingdom's royal court where he plays along with what he thinks is just a bunch of actors, takes on the name Skywalker, bonus points for a Star Wars reference, and doubles down on his role as a harbinger for the arrival of a foreign duke meant to marry the princess. He becomes enamored with the realism of Castle World, but not before witnessing the actual reality of a live beheading. Passing out from the trauma, Jamal wakes up in a panic, realizing that this isn't a theme park, but a time-leaping nightmare. It is the year of our Lord 1328. Oh! With no way home and no other alternative than to keep playing the part of the messenger and now court jester, Jamal tries to make the best out of a bad situation by assimilating into the life of the kingdom quickly gaining favor with the king after accidentally thwarting an assassination attempt. Victoria notices his medallion and assumes that he's a member of her secret rebellion against the usurper king, which couldn't be further from the truth. She automatically assumes the best about him because that's just the kind of optimistic person she is. Compare that to her ideological counter in Percival, who can see straight through Jamal's less than straightforward behavior. They're the same kind of selfish and can read each other like a book, which is emphasized in this great scene of them playing chess with one another, using the game to communicate their true motives. We should get together and play again sometime. I'm sure we will. Jamal may be self-serving on the outside, using his newfound power to take advantage of people, but he's not a monster. When the king tries to have a man executed for stealing a single vegetable for his starving family, Jamal uses his clout with the king to intervene and set the man free. Why are you bringing the pain out of me? I'm security, and you're gonna be punished. Punished severely! With these coins. Huh? Okay, go. Victoria continues to try and push Jamal in the direction of rebellion, but he's too scared, or rather too selfish, to rebel against the king lest he be beheaded for his deceitful ways. He knows the king is a bad ruler, but is more interested in self-preservation rather than tyrannical resistance, much to the disappointment of Victoria. Things get worse when the actual messenger of the duke finally arrives, conflated with Jamal accidentally sleeping with the princess, thinking it was Victoria, landing him in prison for being a fraud due to be beheaded the following morning. It's there that he learns of the legend of the Black Knight, a symbol of hope for these otherwise hopeless people. Before his execution, Jamal throws one last Hail Mary for salvation and claims to be a sorcerer and tries to impress them with his lighter in one of the funniest scenes in the movie and it fails spectacularly. We have fire. Oh. Execute him! It doesn't work obviously, but Jamal is soon saved by none other than Victoria and Nalti where he's taken to the rebel camp and he can see with his own eyes the destitute conditions that they're subject to under the king's rule. He also learns that Nalti was once a great knight before being exiled for serving the deposed queen. Despite just being saved, Jamal tries to break Victoria's convictions by trying to get her to run away with him and leave this whole rebellion behind before Victoria has to look him in the eye and essentially state the film's thesis. I can live with losing the good fight but I cannot live with not fighting it. Jamal takes this lesson in stride and manages to defend Nalti from some unsavory characters using his future knowledge of fighting techniques in the most Martin way possible before ultimately needing the former knight's help himself. Nalti finds the courage to fight back and saves Jamal, beginning a redemption arc for them both. Unfortunately, when they get back to the camp, it's been ransacked and Victoria has been kidnapped by the king's men. When a motivational speech from Jamal isn't enough to rally the rebellion, the queen makes a surprise appearance to win the hearts of the people, but her speech isn't much better. Oh, England! I've heard enough. With some course correction from Jamal using a butchered combination of famous modern day speeches, he manages to galvanize the rebellion with a great training montage using everything from football to wrestling to bolster their chances of victory. To show his appreciation for everything he's done, Nalti bestows Jamal with the set of armor, now considering him a knight. You and I both know I'm no knight. You're as much a knight as any man I know, should you so choose. 
Jamal wrestles with this idea because knights are supposed to be honorable and most of his behavior throughout the film has been anything but. He doesn't want to be seen as someone like Percival who revels in fear. He wants to be someone that Victoria and Nalti can be proud of. He wants to be someone who inspires hope. The next morning when the rebellion attacks, they walk right into an ambush and it's not looking good for them. But when things are at their most dire, the Black Knight suddenly appears, complete with the same dragon breath of legend. Everyone is awestruck right up until... Oh. Despite his clumsy entrance, it is really cool to see Jamal use the spray paint given to him by his boss at the beginning as a punishment to blacken his armor in addition to using it combined with his lighter to simulate the dragon breath. The use of his modern tools to bring the legend to life and ignite the flames of rebellion is such a chef's kiss moment for this otherwise comedic film. Everyone's using what Jamal taught them to turn the tide of battle, including Nalti in a pretty satisfying moment, before being critically injured by an arrow from Percival. Jamal gets to Percival for a 1v1 winner take all final showdown, which is a little more tense than you might expect considering how outclassed Jamal is in this fight. But after looking at Nalti's seemingly dead body, Jamal takes his lessons about knighthood to heart and refuses to give up, pushing forward for another round. In a moment that doesn't quite make sense but is still fun, Jamal uses his knowledge of baseball, basketball, and golf, I guess, to outduel Percival and put him out of commission. While rescuing Victoria, Percival goes for a stab from behind before he's ultimately shot down by Nalti and killed, effectively ending the battle and saving the kingdom. With the queen now back on her throne, she decides to officially bestow Jamal with the title of Black Knight. It seems all is well, he got the girl, he got the title, but in his moment of peak happiness, Jamal is suddenly sat back to the present with the defibrillator having almost drowned in the moat of his job. He wakes up in complete disbelief and confusion and that sentiment is extended to the audience. Did he really travel back in time or was this just some sort of near death hallucination? The resolute answer is, it doesn't matter. Most of the time, I hate the, it was all a dream trope that a lot of stories use because more often than not, it feels like you just wasted your time, but here, the lessons that Jamal learns stick with him and carry over into his real life in ways that we can actually observe. For example, when his boss voices her desire to take his initial advice and sell out, he hits her with this line here, surprising even himself. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It is the presence of fear, yet the will to go on. And with this newfound resolve and Jamal's debatably authentic medieval experience, he eventually helps her into turning her business into the amusement park of her dreams, or rather his dreams, I, I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of dreams, somehow he stumbles upon a woman who looks surprisingly like Victoria and the two establish an instant connection, almost as if they've met before. When she walks off, he rushes after her to get her number before being knocked into the moat once again. And of course, he somehow wakes up and finds himself in the Colosseum of ancient Rome in the middle of a gladiator match where he's chased by lions before the screen fades to black. And that's the movie. It was a stepping stone for Martin Lawrence's Hall of Fame career in Hollywood. He actually just recently, deservedly, and finally received his star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame back in April, and I'm sure Black Knight played its part in that massive accomplishment. This is my favorite Martin movie, but I wanna know yours, so if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment down below letting me know what that movie is, and maybe consider subscribing if you wanna support the channel in a free and easy way, that would be incredibly chivalrous of you. I'm Josh Fleeks. Till next time, y'all be easy.